the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're just so grateful to be in your house this morning. And Father, we're gr I'm, I'm grateful that it's a full house. Uh, there's a lot of faces that I see that we haven't seen in a while, and uh, there's faces that we see every week, and we're grateful for all of them. Father, your love is just so amazing, and your grace is even more amazing. Thank you for that. Thank you for your son's death on the cross, that we might have eternal life. Father, be with us as we continue through the service this morning. Help us to glorify you in our praise. Help us to uh, pay attention to the message that you have to bring to us today through uh, the pastor. Use him in a mighty way. Help us to really pay attention and, and learn your lessons today. All this we ask in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. So, while we're on our bended knees this week, let's remember the missionary of the week. And that's uh, Stan and Jackie Sherwood, and they are in Panama. And I've been there, and that's not an easy place to be. Kind of reminded me of Florida with the humidity. <laughs> uh, so we are having our Lord's Supper on Tuesday, March 26th at 6 p.m. Be here for that if you can be. Uh, we need to, let's go back to Matthew 9.38. I forgot that one. Matthew 9.38 talks about the fact that we need to pray for workers in the harvest. And we all know that the harvest field is white right now. And let's just pray that God would send the workers out there, whether they be overseas or right here in our own backyard. And then uh, we're having Holy Smokes on Thursday, March 28th at 6. That's going to be at the pastor's house. This is for the men. Um, it's always a good time of uh, Bible study and prayer. And, uh, oh, yeah, we get to eat smoked meat, too. So. Uh, Come out to that if you can. We have our missions conference coming up April 3rd through the 7th. Um, if you can be here for all of those meetings, it'll, it'll bless you more than you realize. Um, we do have some really good uh, families, brothers and sisters that are out there representing Christ around the world that we're helping to support. and. Uh, some of them are going to be here, and you'll get a chance to meet them and find out where, where they're at and, and how they're doing. We also have our men's prayer breakfast coming up April 6th at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, yeah, it's a breakfast, so it's in the morning. Um, and then we have uh, that same day at noon in the house, the... Uh, her Heart for Missions, it's a ladies' luncheon. It starts at noon. Be here for that if you can. Um, that'll bless you as well. And then our ladies' meeting, Becoming More Like Christ. It's going to be May 4th at noon. And uh, I'm sure that'll be a blessing as well. Don't forget our mixed adult class meets in the fellowship hall on Wednesdays at 6. The ladies' class meets in the house at 6 as well, and if you can't make it for that one, then you can be here on Thursday at 2, and Miss Chris will be happy to go over it again for you. And I don't think I forgot anything this week. Praise God, and I didn't mess anything up. So. Josh? <laughs> All right. 697, if you're following along in your books there, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. <laughs> Gate 
lights of light if the way of the cross I miss the way of the cross leads home the way of the cross leads home it is sweet to know as I onward go the way of the cross leads home I must need song this morning is going to be 327, The Old Rugged Cross. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, it's Palm Sunday, and so I'd like to read a portion of that in the scriptures this morning, and we'll look to John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12, in the beginning of that chapter, we uh, noticed that Jesus had gone to Bethany, and there where Lazarus um, uh, was raised from the dead, and so he's at the home there with Lazarus and the family, and uh, this is where Jesus is anointed for his burial by Mary and Martha. Uh, but Mary is the one who took that expensive ointment of spikenard and uh, anointed the Lord. And so this happened, we would say, on probably that Saturday um, prior to Palm Sunday. And so if you'll join me there in verse number uh, 12, verse number 12, John 12, it says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast... Uh, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he was, uh, excuse me, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Sion, behold, the king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record. For this cause the people also met him for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. What a great story and testimony to the power of the Lord as well. We see the anointing of him as well. And then this day is the commemoration of that day that he entered, was entering in toward Jerusalem when people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And we know it's not going to be but a few days later that the voices change and their shouts and their chants are of a different nature. And we'll get into that here this morning. But at that thought, let me uh, allow the music to play. If you would just take a moment or two and pray and prepare your mind and heart for the service continued. And uh, then as soon as they're done playing, I will go ahead and pray. Our gracious Father, we come to you this uh, good morning. We're grateful to be in your house. And, and Father, we do come before you asking that you would please bless uh, as you have so far, but continue this service. So we pray that, uh, Lord, that you would be magnified and glorified today. And, and certainly we will lift Jesus up today. And we trust that you will draw men unto uh, him uh, today. Father, thank you for your, your kindness, Lord, your your, uh, the, our ability to be here in service is because of what you've given us, and we thank you for it. And Lord, uh, I pray that you'd bless the power of your word. I pray that you'd help me and these feeble lips to be able to present today uh, the message of the hour. And I pray that, Lord, we would um, do it justice uh, according to Scripture. But Lord, also that you would allow us to receive well what you have for us. Lord, we are in a in a a needy state, Father. We, uh, we as, as humans, even as Christians, certainly 
We need a touch of God, and I pray, please, that you would meet with us today. Thank you for those that have gathered today. Lord, it's a blessing to see families and uh, gathering as well, and, and uh, guests from out of town, and Lord, our folks that normally come, God bless them as well. May we all open our, our, our ears to hear from thee, we pray, in Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. All right, and Brother Jeff, thank you, sir. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid tenderly mourned and wept angels in robes of light arrayed guarded thee whilst thou slept lest i forget gethsemane lest i forget thine agony lest i forget thy love for me lead me to calvary be willing Lord to bear daily my cross for thee even thy cup of grief to share thou hast borne all for me cause lest I forget Gethsemane lest I forget thine agony lest i forget thy love for me lead me to calvary lest i forget thy love for me lead me to calvary Amen, brother. That guitar sounds good, but I know you're the one playing it, but that guitar is, sounds good. Thank you, brother. Beautiful song, timely for sure. And uh, again, we praise the Lord for that. Uh, this morning, we're going to step out of our, our series there on, on uh, uh, Moses, and uh, we're going to move towards the crucifixion day. And... <clears throat> We understand that this is what we would say is the beginning of, of Passion Week um, from Palm Sunday all the way till the next Sunday. Next Sunday, of course, is our, uh, the, greatest, the greatest of all holidays, I guess, if you would say, in Christendom. Uh, we celebrate every, every Sunday the resurrection of Christ, but this specifically as the world uh, pictures and <clears throat> is taking note of what is known as Easter or Resurrection Sunday. Um, and we will do the same. We'll celebrate next week because of all the gloom that happens now and through the week. Uh, it's all taken away after that third day when Jesus rose from the tomb. And so we'll celebrate that next week. Uh, but this week we're going to look here, as the Lord led on my mind and heart, to deal with this subject <clears throat> of, uh, of the presumptions of Pilate. The presumptions of Pilate. And, um, you know, presu presuming things is not always a good idea. It's better to get the facts, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Um, uh, a little definition here <clears throat> of presumption is assuming that something is true. And, and uh, you know, it, it's true because I read it on the Internet. Is that a good statement? 
Probably not. <clears throat> it may be on the internet. It may be true that it's there. Doesn't mean that what it says is true. So, but we'll just just assume things. And and <clears throat> and I, I was thinking of that particular thought of assuming. Um, uh, four years ago, five years ago and a half maybe, I guess, um, I was dating my present wife, amen, Miss Christine. And uh, of course, you may or some may not know, but my, my uh, first wife uh, passed away after uh, our 30 years of marriage just about, and uh, the Lord took her home uh, with cancer and, and such. It was a, a blessing, though, to know that God did not leave me real long without a help meet, and it was good for my kids too, because that, they figured I was going to really run myself into the ground or do something strange or, uh, without having uh, uh, somebody there to take care of me, and because and, I obviously need, need it all, I guess, I don't know. But uh, Chris came and visited with us, and of course she's, you know, looking to, uh, we're looking to get married and, and such, so we're having a great date time, you know, as she's here visiting us, the family, the church. She was actually staying at Pastor and Mrs. Todd's house while she would come and visit, and or I would go up and visit there, and, and I said, hey, Chris, would you like to go? to the Stetson home. They have a Christmas regalia thing going on there. It's beautiful, the Stetson, the Stetson mansion there in the land. And she says, yes, that would be great. I'd love to go there. And I said, well, great. And uh, <clears throat> I got a hold of uh, uh, another preacher in town and, and, uh, in Bunnell and said, hey, brother, I, I know we've dated before on a double date. Would you like to come and, and go with us to this uh, Stetson mansion? And they said, yeah, we'd love to come see Chris again, and blah, blah, blah. We had a great time. I told Chris that this other couple's coming. And she goes, oh. <laughs> and I'm all excited, you know. And so I'm, without her knowing, I said, I said hey, kids, y'all want to go to the Stetson? So my kids, guess what? They all came. And the Claytons were in town. So, hey, brother, Mrs. Clayton, y'all want to come? I took a van load of people to this what was Chris was assuming was going to be a, a nice date, and it turned out to be an event. And so now that's the, the little thing between Chris and I over the last five years. When I say, hey, let's go eat someplace, she'll say, is this a date or is this an event? <laughs> I want to go right up front. I'm like, do I get you by yourself or do I got to share you? You know, that kind of a thing. And so assumptions can really, really cause a problem, right? Um, <clears throat> there's some things that's good to not be under. I was thinking this as well. Things not good to be under. That's good to not be under pressure. Although some work well under pressure. Uh, under the weather is another thing. Probably not a good thing to be under. Uh, but the, certainly a thing that shouldn't be under is under the assumption. Under the assumption. I've got to digress one more time before we get serious. There was a train <clears throat> making its way down the track. And on the train, seated facing each other, were four distinguished people. One was a general, and one was a fair young lady sitting next to him. Across from them were two soldiers. And they're making their way down the track as it would make their noise. As it made its way, of course, the interest was there with the young men and the gal that was there. They came under the tunnel, all the lights went out, and it was quiet and black as can be. And what you heard was a kiss and a smack. <laughs> they came out of the tunnel, late lights come on, and there they all sat facing each other. <laughs> and the one soldier, he looks across and looks around, he's thinking, man, I bet that my friend over here leaned over, gave that gal a kiss, and she smacked him. And the general sitting there, he said, man, I think one of them guys leaned over, kissed this gal next to me, and she smacked me. <laughs> Finally, the guy with a little smile, he says, boy, this is the first time I can kiss my hand and smack a general. <laughs> <clears throat> assumptions. They were all assuming something, right? Well, it's good to get the facts, and I guess somebody had the last laugh in that regard. 
Anyway, um, how do you turn from that to this? I have no idea, but God help us. Um, the title, Pilate's Presumptions Concerning Christ. Pilate's Presumptions Concerning Christ. You know, we could joke about assuming and presuming, but I just want to share today some things that Pilate was presuming that uh, certainly steered him in the wrong direction. Pilate was a man in charge there, and um, he was there in town for this, the festivities, I guess you would say, and um, uh, he didn't care much for the Jewry, the Jewish situation that was there, but he being Roman had to kind of keep things in line and, and allow them to do what they do. And um, what had come before him was an uprising and a difficulty amongst the Jews concerning Jesus Christ. And uh, after going through the Sanhedrin and going through dealing with some of the problems that uh, uh, these Jews were having, um, they had then brought him to Pilate to settle the matter in hopes that they would take a Roman conviction and send him to what they was hoping for, certainly a crucifixion in a Roman way. <clears throat> but Pilate here, he was just the bystander. He's in charge, and now he's left this situation, and he's got to make some decisions regarding Jesus Christ. And that's how we're going to look at our message here today, because we'll make application for us as well. Because it does matter what we do with Jesus Christ. It does matter how we do what Jesus says he is, what he's, we know that he did according to Scripture, how we receive that, how we would by faith trust that it is true, how that we might accept him as our Savior rather than paying for our sins of ourselves for, for eternity. That decision is then ours to make, and it must be done concerning Christ. And so uh, there's some presumptions that we see in the life of Pilate that I want us here today to make sure we don't make those same presumptions. Because those same presumptions that, that Mr. Pilate had done here this day, we see is very evident in our life today. And we'll see them here, I hope, in a clear way as we look at Pilate and his presumptions. He thought, he thought that uh, uh, he, he, he needed help in the case, certainly, of, of Jesus Christ. And so he made some presumptions that would help him make a decision concerning Christ. And so if you'll join me in Luke chapter number 23, Luke 23, and we'll look there in verse number 1. Luke 23 and verse number 1, it says, And the, the whole multitude of them arose and led them unto Pilate. Now, I didn't give you the title, probably should have. It might have been up on the screen. But Pilate presumed that his taking a pass would help. This was his first presumption. He thought that taking a pass would help his case concerning Jesus Christ. Verse number one, again, it says, And the whole multitude of them arose and, and, and led him unto Pilate. They had just been before this governing body of the Jews, and now they come here to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they uh, and they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged into Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem, at that time. 
Well, it just happens to be that these governing heads were gathered in the same area because of the festivities that were going on. And as Pilate here presumed here that to take a pass, uh, he thought this was very hmm, happenstantial, maybe. And he's thinking, well, I can get out of this situation because I, it's, a, it's a sticky wicket. I don't want to be a part of this thing that's happening amongst these Jews and whoever this Jesus is. <clears throat> of course, he's, he knows who Jesus is. He's heard what's gone on. It's not unknown to him, but now he sees him face to face. And he decides to take a pass. He decides to go ahead and let, let Herod deal with it. I mean, why do something when someone else can do it, right? That's a good old uh, adverb to, 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 to say. That's a good thing, I guess. Uh, no, that's not, that's not taking responsibility. But here he chooses to take a pass. Because wouldn't most people want to avoid controversy? Sure. So if he thought he could get away with it, he thought he could take a pass on this situation, he could allow someone else to deal with the sticky wicket, it would be better for them than it is for me to deal with it. He's saying, I'll take a pass, skip me, go on to the next one. That's just how he's thinking of this. You know, um, he may have thought and presumed taking the pass would help, but we'll find it didn't. And I think I want to encourage us today, too, that when it comes to concerning Christ and our decision for Him. Listen, whether it's for salvation or if it's for service for Him, it's for doing something that He has desired on you to do, and you would say, oh, I'll take a pass. I'll let someone else more qualified do it. I'll go, even though I'm called, this is now in my hands. God has placed this with upon me. I, I think I'm going to find a way to give it away. It's almost like hot potato. Did you ever play hot potato? Hopefully not with a hot potato, but playing the the game would be something that I'm familiar with. You just don't want to be caught with it in your hands. He didn't want to be caught with Jesus in his hands here. So he thought he could take take a pass. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no passes to take when it comes to Jesus. The Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. There is an appointment that you and I have with death. If we'd like to take a pass from death, I think that would be kind of a cool thing, especially as days grow grow, uh, closer, your body is more feeble, and you're thinking, I I don't know what death is all about. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't face it. You know, we'd love to take a pass from it, but we can't. We all know this. As humans, we recognize it almost on a daily basis or weekly basis of somebody that we know or have heard of that has made their journey to to eternity one way or the other. There's no taking a pass with Jesus. This he presumed, ladies and gentlemen, this will not work in your case for Christ as well. Number two, look with me as we look at verse number eight. It says, and when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad. For he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, certainly being up in Galilee, all the things that Jesus had done. It says, and he had hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. He didn't want Jesus for his saving power. He wanted Jesus for the spectacle that it was. He was looking to see what this man can do with what we would want to go see a magician to do per se. He wanted the entertainment value of it. He was excited to see see him. Verse 9 says, Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. See, Jesus knew what was in the mind of Herod. He wasn't going to go down that road. Scripture says there in verse 10, And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, sat him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again back to Pilate. I didn't give you the title again. I'm sorry, folks, in the back. But Pilate presumed that having an ally would help him. Pilate presumed that having an ally would help him. Notice there, 
verse number 12. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. So verse 12 is the verse that shows us that day seemed like a day that they got together and put bygones bygones. It's just speculation as to know what the issues were between those two heads of state. But we see on that day they made themselves friends. It makes you wonder that when there's enemies, they can become friends when it comes to Christ against Christ. He thought, Pilate thought, if I can't take a pass, maybe I'll take a partner. Maybe I'll have someone that will believe what's going on and he'll be on my side. Uh, if, if I can't let it be done on someone else's terms, then maybe I can link arms with somebody else and, and have a partner in crime, so to speak. Well, again, he didn't, and it didn't work out. He was no partner in this situation, so his presumption failed. And so we then bring that back to us here today as we, we think of the same idea that we might presume that if we could take a, couldn't take a pass, well, maybe we can have a partner. Maybe we could have someone that'll, that will stand with us concerning Christ. Someone that can have, that will be a, a friend, that will kind of be there with you. Well, please, that's not how the Bible works it out at all. The scripture says, so then every one of us, in Romans 14, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of, what's that word? Himself to God. We stand before God alone, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have a partner. We don't have a friend that we've known for 80 years. Get to stand before God with you to hold you up, to encourage you and be a, a friend. That's not happening. Everything is on you when it comes to judgment before God. Don't make the assumption that an ally is going to help your case. Ecclesiastes 11.9 says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But thou know that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. What's that saying? Have your fun. Do what you want to do. Whatever's good in your own eyes. Hey, you're young and strong and what, death has no grip on you. Why, the, other people may die, but you won't. And surely uh, the numbers are in your favor. Go live life and have fun. Eat, drink, be merry. The truth is, death happens. And when you stand before God, you won't have a friend. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And there will be a friend that will stand beside you on your judgment day if you'll but let him. We learn of it there in Proverbs 18. I think we, most of us would know that. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We, we would look to that as application of Jesus Christ himself that will stick to you. Jesus was the friend of sinners, the scripture says. And I'll know there was one day that I was a lost sinner. See, I'm still a saved sinner because none of us got rid of the sins problem. Amen? But a lost sinner and a saved sinner are two different things. A lost sinner will die in his sins and go to hell. A saved sinner will die but in Christ and be in heaven and no longer have to deal with the sins of that flesh amongst us evermore, anymore. We'll be out of the, from the power and the grip of, of sin and be out of the presence of sin. That's the blessing that we'll have because Jesus is my friend and my Savior. Amen. So when I stand before God and on that judgment day, I have an advocate with me. I have a lawyer, Jesus Christ. He is the one who stands and says, dear Father, he is mine. He is mine because of my blood was shed, and I applied it to him, and now he stands washed in the blood of the Lamb, and enter into heaven. If you want to look at it that way, I know that's not the progress of how it happens because of the time of judgment and all, but we have our 
entrance to heaven because of our friend, Jesus Christ, the one who'll stick with us, the ally, the only ally that will help us. Pilate presumed again, number three, Pilate presumed that appeasement would help. Pilate presumed that appeasement would help. Look at verse number 13. It says, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto him, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you and have found no fault in this man, touching those things which or whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, my good old buddy Herod, he didn't find a, a problem here either. For I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was uh, of necessity he must, re, uh, must release one unto them at the feast. So he says, I am going to release one and he liked to release him to them. <clears throat> what we're saying is he, he's presuming that an appeasement would help. They want him to be crucified, as we will see. They want judgment on Jesus. But he wasn't willing to do that, but he'd give him a bone. He'd give him something that they might, might help appease the problem. Hey, I'll scourge him. We'll beat him. We know that at some point here, as, we, as he's before, before a, a pilot, remember Herod already dressed him in the robe, his gorgeous robe. We also know, according to the other gospels there, that they had already plaited this, the crown of thorns on his head. He was already there with blood coming down his sides of his cheek. He had been whipped. He'd already been ready for crucifixion, ready for that picture of the king as he was ha having that robe, as he stood before the people that day. Herod, uh, I mean, uh, Pilate said, I'll give you the bone. We'll whip him and we'll beat him. But I'm going to not crucify him. The presumption was that this would work and help him in this case. And we find that that presumption didn't work either, did it? And I guess if we make a little bit of a, a thought for us, Maybe we kind of want to throw a bone to God, so to speak. We know God, desert, God looks at our sin and desires judgment for that sin. And there has to be a sin payment made. But we'll say, what can I do to earn God's approval? What can I do maybe of my good works that I can do and work and, and do something to make him happy? But you're a sinner. Your sins divide you between you and God, and there's no way you can make him happy except for the sins to be gone from you, and that's only done through Jesus and his shed blood, appropriated to you through your salvation. But we, we look at it today, and many religions of the day will think of that and say, hey, we have a works salvation. We, we can earn our way to Christ, or it's a combination of our works and our trust in Christ. Titus says this in Titus 3, 5. Paul writes this to Titus, rather, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Please let us see the scripture here. We can't throw a bone to the Lord. We can't appease him in any way of our works. Only the blood is going to work, not a bone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, these are very popular for us, isn't it? It says, For by grace ye are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Lest any man would say, hey, here you go, God. Guess what I'm doing for you? Why, I'm going to live and keep the Ten Commandments. Uh, anyone ever try that? You ever try keeping the Ten Commandments? Yeah, we ought to. I mean, they're worthy of, of our, of our uh, acceptance, and they still work, <laughs> amen? That, that wasn't done away with. But we know we can't keep up with the Ten Commandments. 
And I won't get into all of those reasons why and the implications that's therein because that's not part of my message that I know my one side wants to keep running with it, but I'm going to say no. <laughs> Appeasement, our works, doing something with our hands will not help the case that you have concerning Jesus Christ. Don't let that be an assumption or your presumed thought of appeasement. Number four, Pilate presumed that his decisive power would help. Paul presumed that his decisive power would help. Now that's going to have to take us out of Luke and over to the book of John. John here, the same portions of scripture, speaking of the same subject. John chapter 19, verse 8, it should be on the screen. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Question mark. Knowest thou not that I have it in my notes here, bold, I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Who made him that powerful? Could anyone kill Jesus? Is there an answer here? No one could kill Jesus. The scripture says he laid his life down for you and for me. There is no power that he would have. This was a presumptive power. He assumed that he had decisive power over Jesus. Now here's my little side thinking here is, I know that, that God is gracious and merciful and that he would give space to repent. And maybe Pilate's already gone beyond that point, but let's think of it this way. What if he said, I, because I know you're right, and I can't in good terms with myself crucify you or send you to be crucified because I know you're the spotless lamb of God. What if he trusted Christ as his savior? and all glory to be given to this now man righteous before God. But you'd say, well, hey, he's supposed to, he's supposed to uh, fulfill Scripture. And he was supposed to, yeah, you know what? Guess what would have happened? It's still Scripture would have been fulfilled. And maybe it would have been Herod that had to step inside and say, crucify him. See, what Jesus was, gonna, what was going to be done was going to be done according to Scripture, according to prophecy. But yet we have space for repentance. Amen. He, though, still felt he had the power that he could make a choice. Let him know that, hey, Jesus, I can save you or I can crucify you. Jesus answered him in verse 11. Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. There is no power except that my heavenly Father gave you that power, Pilate. So don't make the assumption or presume that your, your powers are going to help you in this case. Matthew 10, 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, Jesus speaking, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It's not your decision. It's not your power. It's truly God's. Second Thessalonians says it this way in verse 1. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall reveal, be revealed from heaven and his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Who's got the power? God has the power. So we must live in fear, recognizing, hey, I can't of my own self have the power over Christ. But rather, God's power is certainly over me. And if I do not trust the gospel and do not trust him as my Savior, he has the power and the authority and the obligation to send me to judgment for my sins forever in hell. 
Can I, have, can I help you with one power that you have? You've got the power to choose. God gave you that power. God gave you the power to choose. Choose life. Choose Christ. Hey, Pilate, choose Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, don't presume you have any power other than the power to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Pilate presumed he had this decisive power. Pilate presumed that he had appeasement, that that would help. He presumed that taking a pass might help him. He presumed certainly having an ally might help him. But how about this, number five? Pilate presumed that his ceremonial cleansing would help. He presumed that his ceremonial cleansing would help in this case for Jesus Christ. We have to go to Matthew now, Matthew chapter number 27. Verse 24 says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Okay, he's making a presumption there, right? Because this wasn't going to do. His washing in the, in the pot, that picture that was given, he was in a ceremonial way trying to absolve himself from the problem that was there with. Absolve himself from the blood of this just man that was going to die. <clears throat> he still was liable. And there are preachers that I know of today that would be preaching, saying that Pilate is still in hell, going like this, <laughs> trying to wash his hands. It didn't work. He presumed the ceremonial, ceremonial, ceremonial cleansing would help him. We understand in the Old Testament there was ceremonial cleansing. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. See, now we're speaking New Testament here. Back there, those sins were pushed forward because of the ceremonial cleansing there that they would have. But that was pictures of what Christ would do on the cross of Calvary. And now today, ladies and gentlemen, because of that ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, there is no power in this, the blood of goats or bulls or doves or sheep. It's all because of Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, Pilate presumed his ceremonial, uh, ceremonial cleansing would help him. Please understand that there's no washing that we can do whether some believe even the baptistry waters. So I'm going to tell you this quickly. When we're done here in a few minutes, we get to have a baptism. Amen. We have Brother Bide's couch here today, his family. And uh, he's going to join our church by way of baptism. So I want to have you come and, and uh, view that here in just a little bit. And so we thank God for him and his family being here today. We'll give you a greeting, certainly. And, uh, but you know, see, that, that what we'll see is a, is a visual. It's a figure. It's a picture but it does nothing to wash away the sins of, of Brother Bige. It just shows what has been done, that Jesus did wash away his sins, and that Jesus was buried, and that Jesus was raised again. And that's what we're going to show as a picture to, and testimony to everybody else. But see, that will not help. It didn't help Pilate. It cannot help us. Please understand, that water today can clean no one's sins. Sixth one today is our last. Pilate presumed that his pardoned replacement would help. Pilate presumed that his pardoned replacement would help. This is the story of Barabbas. We didn't speak of him yet. He was intermixed in the story here. But in Luke 23, verse 18, if you'll join me there, it says, And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Hey, I'll, uh, can I throw you a bone again? Can, can, we, can we revisit this? 
And they were instant with their loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. Why is the blood guiltiness on Pilate? Because he said, Pilate sentenced him. It was by his authority. Verse number 25. And he released unto them, for that sedition and murder uh, was cast into prison, whom they had desired. So he released unto him that man who was the murderer. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Well, he's making a little substitutionary thing going on here. We see the picture that's there. There had to, this had to have been done according to, as it see, we see, the law of the Jewish folks at the time. And because of the feast coming, they could allow someone to be set free. Well, you and I know, even Pilate knew, Herod knew, that this shouldn't be Jesus. I mean, it should be Jesus, that he should be set free, because he was a, a sinless person in this regard. And Barabbas was a known thief, and a known robber, and a known murderer. Why should he be let go? But that was the exchange given. He made a substitutionary change there. He's hoping that would help his case with Christ. Well, it didn't help him. Jesus went on and died. Pilate went on to hell, recognizing that all his presumptions came to naught. He chose wrong when it come to Jesus Christ. Maybe he could be thinking today, could there be a replacement for me? Could someone have take my, taken my place? Well, in closing here today, Jesus took your place. Amen. Jesus took your place. See, that pardoned replacement, he's pardoning you and replacing you, essentially, from your death, your judgment of your sins, and he himself went to the cross and paid your debt, paid for your sins for all eternity, past, present, and future. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, I love these three words, died for us. He died for us. Isaiah 53, 6 says, And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity, iniquity of us all. That's our sins were laid on the great shepherd Jesus and the great Lamb of God, Jesus. Our sins were placed on him. 1 John 3, 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life. Pilate didn't kill him. He laid his life down for us. Again, we see the switch. We see the replacement. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him, as is God hath made Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, who should have been on that tree was Barabbas the sinner. Who should have been on the tree? That murderer. But Jesus took his place. And that shows a picture here today of you are the Barabbas. I am the Barabbas. Just as guilty as Barabbas was, we should have been crucified. We should be paying for our sins in such a way. But no, Jesus was that pardoned, pardoned us. And he switched us switched our places. For you and I, Jesus died. He took upon our sins. He took upon him the ability to stand before God with his shed blood to say, you and I, if we've trusted him, if we've appropriated the blood of Christ upon us, by nature of us calling upon Christ, turning from our sins and turning unto Christ in just a simple prayer and asking the Lord to save us, to wash our sins away, that we might walk in newness of life, so to speak, and which is pictured in our baptism. We then can be saved. We can be a child of God. Pilate here made some awful presumptions and that got him nowhere. 
Ladies and gentlemen, my prayer is that you make none of those presumptions either. Get the facts. Know the truth. And the truth will make you free. And that's Jesus. Let Him be the one. He already did. He doesn't have to go to the cross again and again and again. It's already happened in the past. He sits at the, His Father's side today. And He looks to you to be saved and trusting Him as your Savior. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Pilate's presumptions. God help us. Don't assume anything. Know that Jesus is your Savior, but you're guilty before God. But you can be saved today. Father, bless us, we pray. Thank you for this Jesus Christ. It does matter what we do with him. And we know on this time so many years ago that Jesus would soon be ready to die. And he died for all mankind and he paid for the sins. His blood was enough for all the sins of all the world. And God, that day in February 1995, I trusted Christ as my Savior. Thank you for that day. I pray that there's folks here today that can have a celebratory thought of knowing the day that they were saved. But if there's one here today that knows not Jesus as their Savior, they've not had that day of cleansing. They've not come before Christ asking to be saved. God, may this day be their day. Putting all assumptions and presumptions aside, may we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand, please. I'm going to have Josh.